close as an international hero, a figure in history, and a man who no longer could practice his profession, a test pilot whose wings were clipped because NASA didn't want a chance losing its hero. Now he's Neil Armstrong, a very private citizen. One of the men most affected by his moonwalk was Jim Irwin, who flew on Apollo 15. Today, Irwin tours the world preaching, telling people how he found God and came to Christ on the moon. Which walk will you choose? Would you choose that moon rock, or will you choose this rock, this rock of Jesus Christ, this living rock, this rock which will never leave you, that you can never lose? I ask you to make that decision tonight. You know, Jim, you've had the opportunity to go to the moon, which in its way made you a really exclusive American hero. Do you feel that perhaps walking away from that program is, is being a dropout in any way? No, I certainly don't view it that way, Roy. It really, it's a, it's a step up for me. The experiences that I went through on the moon uh, brought me to a new realization uh, of what, you know, what God is, to feel God's presence so closely on the moon. Uh, I realize that I have some fame, you know, as a result of being an astronaut who's had the opportunity to go to the moon. And I'd like to use that fame, uh, be it ever so short, for uh, a religious, for a Christian purpose, because I can't think of a higher calling than to share a religious message with people everywhere. I invite you to come forward, say, Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. mankind's history. But the question about Noah's Ark simply isn't, did it exist, but where is it today? We do know where the Titanic is, but yet Noah's Ark has yet to be found. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is author of the book, The Unsolved Mystery of Noah's Ark. And our guest today has spent, along with her late husband, more than a quarter of a century trying to answer this particular question. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, Miss Mary Irwin. Mary, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Well, thank you, Daniel. It's a privilege and a delight. You know, this is one of those stories, you know, again, the Titanic, almost everybody alive today knows about this, you know, and this is something recent. Noah's Ark really isn't that old in the scheme of things, and yet here was a ship that literally could have almost housed the Titanic, and we can't seem to figure out where it is. Why is that? Well, first of all, I have a hard time, very difficult, wrapping my brain around how big it was. Right. I, really, if you ever just walking on a length of one football field but three, right. it's, it's tough. But why uh, haven't we really been able to uh, nail down where this ark landed? Well, I think that's a real good question. And uh, people have, men have searched for the ark for really hundreds of years. And we go back to ancient historians like Herodotus and Josephus who wrote about it. Even Marco Polo uh, was talking about it, but he never saw anything either. They only um, quoted from one another's writings. They just really didn't see it. Mm-hmm. Now, what really, I guess, aided you to decide to spend, again, more than 25 years you know, looking into the evidence about Noah's Ark, if in fact it existed, and where is it? How do we find it? I didn't have a difficult time believing God's word that it did exist. But what I was trying to sort out were all the stories I was uh, had read about. Now, this elderly gentleman uh, who since passed away, Earl Cummings, had come to my uh, my home seeking my husband Jim's help in trying to get back on the mountain, Mount Ararat in Turkey, to look for the ark. He had been there, I don't know how many times, maybe 10, 15 times, over there searching, searching, searching. 
and suddenly the um, Turkish government closed the uh, Mount Ararat to all climbing uh, permits. They just it just wasn't going to happen. So Mr. Cummings came to my home to ask Jim if uh, his fame from being an astronaut did he think that maybe uh, they would open the mountain for him and some climbers. Well, that's what happened. Jim did write a letter to, uh, I think, General Tormte, and uh, it just went on up into the command, and he was allowed to bring men in. So there were 12 of them that went that one year. <clears throat> but before Mr. Cummings left our home, he left a book with us that his wife, Violet, had just, it was just hauled off the press, called, Has Anyone Really Seen Noah's Ark? And so I grabbed that book right away and just began to be absorbed in it. And the way my mind works, sort of like a detective, um, I was writing in the book and writing on paper, okay, this person said this, this one said this. Well, now this doesn't agree with that. So it was difficult for me to try to sort out who saw what and whether they were telling the truth or not, or whether they were just um, fantasizing, whether they did see something, I didn't know. But later I found that since Mount Ararat is a volcanic mountain, there are many fracture patterns in, uh, in the rock. And uh, it, it is so, so cut so clearly cut whenever those fracture patterns occur that it is it's very regular and it's very deceiving. At a long, long distance, it does look like there is something there on the side of the mountain, and that's why men keep trucking over there. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, let's talk about Ararat because this is where it is alleged that Noah's Ark ended up, Okay. But obviously, as you talk about in the book a little further and you actually quote from the Bible what it says, well, maybe that's not the case. But I'd like to talk about, first of all, Mount Ararat, first of all, before we get into all that. That's now, describe, cool. describe this mountain for our listeners out there who probably mostly have heard the name but really aren't familiar with what it is. Well, in uh, eastern Turkey, it's very, very close, probably... Mm, in 10 miles from the Russian border. And uh, there is greater Ararat, and next to it is lesser Ararat. Now, really, nothing really grows uh, at all on lesser Ararat. It is just full of what is known as scree. Scree is like fine gravel. And so people, don't, they're not on that mountain. Mm -hmm. A few people live at the foot of the... Uh, of Mount Ararat, the greater one, because this is where they have their um, their sheep, their flocks, all, all summer long, and this is this is their way of life. Well, the scripture tells us it is in the that the ark landed in the mountains of Ararat. However, people keep saying it's Mount Ararat that it landed on, but that is not what scripture said. So. They keep going back, and there are men that are going back every year, like Dick Bright. He's been over there, oh, I'm thinking at least 20 times he spent a fortune going over there. And if you talk to him today, he is convinced it's there, and he's going back again. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, there's a part in your book that you talk about, or you actually share the idea of tradition as you describe the fiddler on the roof. And it's interesting how we have oral traditions, and pretty soon it gets to a point we just don't tend to question the information itself. We just tend to believe it, you know, sort of the foundation of belief, uh, you know, even the evolution of myth itself. And I had some funny experience with how quickly this can actually happen. Uh, as anyone who's ever been up to the Northwest, uh, there is an area in Washington, uh, which is the Mount Adams National Park. Mm -hmm. Now, in that area, there is a man with a farm, and it is considered to be one of the premier sites for people who are interested in gazing and searching for the extraterrestrial, the UFOs. Apparently, this uh, Mount Adams was a place where 
one of the first believed UFO sightings had ever occurred. And so this guy has a farm. It's been featured on radio shows countlessly uh, throughout the years. But you can go out to this man's farm, and sure enough, on the gate, you know, it's featured on coast-to-coast radio. This is the UFO place. You can come out there at night and look for UFOs. He's got a great view of Mount Adams off in the distance. And if you don't see any UFOs, what you will experience is, you know, celestial views that are just breathtaking, to say the least. But what was interesting is the night that we happened to be out there, there seemed to be a helicopter.